it's Rob Bryanson. Welcome back to the Imagine the Tenth Dimension video blog. And if you'd like to read along, today's entry is dated November 5th, 2008, and you can read along at tenthdimension.com slash blog. Uh, we're talking about the poll questions that have been running along the side. Uh, we're up to poll question number 23 today, which was, why is it impossible to exceed the speed of light? Because our universe is being created one Planck length at a time at the speed of light. Uh, that poll ended on September 20th, 2008, and 66% of the people uh, visiting our blog agreed, while the rest disagreed. Now, I wonder if some people disagreed with the above statement because of my choice of the word created. Terms like this can be confusing when the universe we're imagining is really just being observed one Planck length after another from out of a, a wave function of probable, a probability outcomes. As Everett's Many Worlds interpretation has it, and as this project also has it, the other possible universes continue to exist out there within timelessness. They're just not the version that we're observing at this now within space-time. In quantum mechanics, then, references to collapsing the wave function through observation are really just talking about observing the wave function. According to this way of thinking, whether you use one term or another, you're really talking about the same process. Now, in my book, I talk about the speed of light being an independent constant. No matter how fast you travel, no matter how close to the speed of light you get, light continues to travel at the speed of light away from you. In my book, I suggested that this was because of our reality being created or observed by quanta, slices of the universe, that each exist one Planck unit of space-time away from the next. I also suggest that this effect would be the same not only with your speed, but your direction in time. And in a fanciful mental exercise, we imagined some reverse time aliens constructed from the chemical processes that make just as much sense in time's opposite direction. Those reverse time creatures, then, would also experience the speed of light as an independent constant. And even if they were to travel at close to the speed of light in time's opposite direction, they too would find that the speed of light didn't change and it would continue to move away from them at the same speed. The October issue of Scientific American has an article on loop quantum gravity, which talks about a concept called atoms of space-time. While atoms is an unfortunately confusing term to use in this discussion, it is the same idea that my way of visualizing the dimensions uses. Our reality and our experience of time and space appears to be continuous, but in fact it is created by a mesh of quanta, or atoms of space-time that are each one Planck length away from the next. And my entry, The Flip Book Universe, is one of a number of blog entries that talk about this idea. According to Michio Kaku in his thought-provoking Physics of the Impossible, Einstein's most famous equation is really not accurately represented. Rather than E equals mc squared, the more correct representation is E equals plus or minus mc squared. In You and Me and We Are All Together, uh, I also talked about the idea that physicists generally agree that antimatter is just matter traveling in time's reverse direction. All of these ideas tie together into a deeper understanding that our experience of time zero is really not the full picture of reality. And this is something I've discussed in blog entries like Time as a Direction and Time in Either Direction. One of the most popularly viewed blog entries in the last couple of months here uh, at the Imagining the Tension Dimension blog has been Moving Dimensions and Synchromysticism, in which I talk about the mind-bending work of Jake Kotze and the mind-bending Moving Dimensions Theory, MDT it's often abbreviated, of Dr. Elliot McGuckin, and the brief summation of which I will quote again here. Dr. McGuckin says, the only way to stay stationary in the fourth dimension is to move at the speed of light. Ergo, the fourth dimension is expanding at the rate of c relative to the three spatial dimensions. Now this idea is easily related to my way of visualizing the dimensions, I believe, and gives us an intuitive way to understand the quandary of why the speed of light doesn't change. No matter what direction in space you travel, and no matter whether you're traveling forward or backward in time. Bravo, Elliot McGuckin. To close, here's the video blog for another entry which talks about moving dimensions theory. And again, that's if you're uh, reading along uh, with this blog, I post it there. Uh, I'm also, if you're watching this on YouTube, I'll post a link to that uh, blog entry as well. So that's all for today. 
My name is Rob Bryanton from the Imagining the Tenth Dimension video blog. Enjoy the journey.